Hello, everyone, and welcome to Cut and Splice. This is Matt. And this is Gil. And this is Jason. So this time around, we will be discussing Kevin Costner's 2003 film Open Range, starring Robert Duvall, the very young Diego Luna, uh, Luna uh, forgive me, uh, including Michael Gambon and uh, basically an all-star cast. It's one of the few... Um, well, I, I'm going to tip my hat and say one of the few stellar Westerns that we've had uh, this century. Uh, it, it, it was fairly popular at the time, but kind of flew under the radar, I think. Uh, but uh, it, it received some um, positive reactions, especially from uh, Western nuts like me. So, uh, But anyway, I'll open it up to you guys and... Uh, yeah, I uh, so so Jason didn't know that Kevin Costner directed. <laughs> <laughs> I think I knew, I just didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Subliminal, you know. Yes. No, that that is like uh, interesting because yes, he's he's very famous for a few of the movies that he's directed, and and in particularly, um, of course, like Dances with Wolves, which I I kind of thought about while I was watching this movie because, um. Because I really thought, like, oh wow, like this is so profound, and everything is so meticulous, and it's so accurate, and and it's everything that the legend of um, Dances with Wolves is, only that it isn't. It's um like it's it's the movie that you want to experience when you watch Dances with Wolves with the expectation, um, but but you don't get. That's my recollection. I I almost this movie makes me want to revisit it almost to see um, how it aged for me because this aged really well. I um, I hate this movie. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I think I'd only seen this movie in its entirety one time before this. Um, I know. My grandmother was, uh, Westerns were her favorite kind of movies. And she always loved Westerns. When this movie came out, I think she was playing it in some, you know, I, I walked into the room at various points that this movie was on um, a number of times over the, uh, you know, over like, let's say 2004, 2005, around that time. And I think it was probably around then, maybe 2005 or six, when I finally sat down and just like watched it all from beginning to end. And I just remember thinking like, oh, this is a really great movie. And then I never really felt the need to watch it again. Not that I didn't feel the urge. I just didn't really feel the need to watch it again because um, at least probably once a year or so, um, I probably have some sort of, conversation with matt about how much he loves this movie and then it's like i kind of get the feeling like i've seen it again because he talks about it a lot so um yeah reliving it yeah yeah um i think i was uh, trying to avoid to say this before the recording but uh but every, uh, the whole time i was watching it uh all i could think about every time i see uh uh, Robert Duvall's character is uh, is the uh, the Godfather's episode <laughs> where you you reference the uh, Robert Duvall <laughs> that, yeah. that, that thing in like uh, yep whatever what was family it guy. like the uh, Family Guy and uh, even though I don't I haven't seen it <laughs> but it just it just made me laugh but um, you probably yeah. did see it at one point. I bet you when we were all living together, we probably watched the, because um, that's the Star Wars episode. So we probably watched that at some point in time, at oh. least the first one. But it's it's not like, that. that's just like a little tag at the end of the thing. So it's like, it wouldn't have been the most memorable part of it that we would have seen. You know what? Well, I, I probably did see it, yeah. That wasn't the Star Wars episode. Wasn't it? It wasn't? No, no it was the one where they were locked in their safe room because a bunch of burglars... Isn't... Isn't the yeah, one where yeah. they're locked in the safe room be, when they decide to, he tells the story of Star Wars because they're no, locked no, in? no. He it, it has nothing to do with Star Wars. He was telling the uh, Griffin family history, oh, and, okay. and he brought up I'm, the Godfather thing because they were all going to die because of the uh, safe yeah, the room water, was flooded. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. I, I remember the the premise of the joke. I just didn't remember why they were all in there. But yeah, anyway, yeah. whatever. All right, okay. 
<laughs> in any case, uh, in question for Matt, uh, I guess, because um, I, I was thinking, so at this point, it's not even a trilogy. So it's uh, we're in the realm of, of the saga of uh, of movies that uh, you're obsessed with because they have to do with freedom. Uh, is that a correct assessment? Part of uh, your obsession with the movie? Well, it, it's certainly a, a a component that I uh, that I very much appreciate. I mean, you know, again, this movie came out almost exactly twenty years ago, um, and uh, you know, so I was, you know. 18 you know, 17 well you know pushing 18 still kind of an idiot kid so i mean that definitely wasn't in the forefront of my mind when i was first watching it and you know just kind of enjoying the the overall drama of the film and the uh i mean obviously it has one of the most one of the best like climactic shootouts that i've seen in a long time i I mean not the i mean obviously the sergio leone films did a much better job of like the build-up and you know the like the tension without the guns even being fired but like the the moment the first shot is fired that starts the whole climax of this movie it's just like game on really uh it really entertaining stuff for younger people uh but yeah, yeah. As I've grown up a, a bit and watched it uh, several times over, it's a movie that definitely has a lot of very strong ideas. And uh, you know, I, I'm also kind of reminded about uh, what Roger Ebert said about it about how um, uh, you know westerns uh, have always been contrasted to a lot of mainstream action movies or is like a lot of the mainstream action movies movies are about you know finding a way for your team to win as opposed to westerns that are more built around people who have real values and act on them and this is definitely one of those westerns where the characters have very clear values and they act on them it was also nice to um see uh, diego luna when he was younger yeah. he was <laughs> great I, in this. yeah i was uh, obviously and then i seeing this right after i saw the endor series uh, all i can think is that every time he speaks but uh but yeah no it's um it's it's a good cast and then the uh the guy uh abraham ben ruby right the guy who was um um, Jason mentioned him in an earlier podcast. The big uh, guy. Are you talking about one of the, the actors? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the guy that was in, like, uh, I think it was, like, in Parker Lewis. The, you know, the big guy. The, um, yeah, the guy who plays Mose. Mose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 He, so it was, like, two. Good actor. Yeah, exactly. It was, like, two two uh, actors that was nice to see, like, uh, them from back when. But, yeah. And Annette yeah. Benning, too, like. Yeah, I think the net Benning is it gives one of her best performances in this movie. Yeah, like everybody's like, a, like a game. Definitely, like I don't know what was up, but but something was just really well wired with this movie, especially with the lead roles. Yeah, I this is a, I mean, I don't know, it's kind of a weird comment to make, but I mean, I feel like this is like a really big role for that. Um, uh, I don't know how to say his last name, Abraham Ben Ruby guy. Um, cause he's a, he's a really good actor. He just, he always seems to play like little small character roles. And this was like, th- not to say that this isn't a character role, but I mean, it's like, th- this is a, when you've got a whole movie about these, these guys, you know, moving cattle and there's only four of them, the team of guys is only four. I mean, like he's a pretty big part of this movie. <laughs> yeah. And there's also, uh, uh Michael uh, Jeter, the, and the, the guy with the stable thing. Yeah, yeah, he's good. That was also a very memorable performance. We don't get a whole lot of Kim Coates, but he's really good in it, too. Yeah, uh, where where was he? I'm trying to remember. He is the, um, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but he's the the, the gunslinger, you could could say. Yeah, yeah. on the henchman. Yeah. The one one all the other henchmen talk about. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, just trying to think. Um, yeah, but but overall, it's um, it's I, I guess it's a good um, thing to bring up. Is like westerns. I, I don't know if westerns are for everybody. It's definitely a, a genre that uh, works for most, but not for all. But uh, and also, I even though it's like a fairly long movie, and it's not all action. A lot of it is just very slow paced. Um, I feel like it's just very well. I don't know, just moment to moment. It's just it really holds, like it holds your attention really well. So uh, it's something that I would dare to suggest to more people because it definitely like just kind of flows like really well. Uh, so so it's not really like too slow. It's not too artsy. It's um, it's not too realistic, even though it has moments of that. So so I feel like it's got a little bit for everybody. It's it's totally. Um, just for the performances alone, I think is a, a worthwhile watch. Um, I mean, as far as rating it, I, I would be, I'm trying to think of Westerns that I would give like a nine or a 10, but I, I, I have to definitely give this like an eight, if not even inching towards a nine, but like around eight and a half or something. We can talk about it more in detail, but um, later, I mean, but um, I was trying to think of where I would put it as well what a kind of grade i'd give it um i decided to go ahead and list my uh favorite westerns and pretty much every western that i think i have seen on a list and try to see where i would put it and i put it at number 10 out of all of them ever so that's pretty good because it was a pretty long list um i would i would have to say that everything in this top area would be like um like a nine or a ten so i you know i mean I'd, I'd feel pretty comfortable saying that this movie's like a nine cool um you know maybe not the strongest of nines but it's a nine i i, I feel comfortable saying that at least what's the uh the rest of your uh, list oh well we, we can talk about that later oh, okay maybe after yeah let yeah, matt yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. go uh with your uh assessment i think that uh this movie is kind of the western equivalent for me of uh dark city and that it's a movie that not that many people have seen and whenever i get an opportunity to recommend it i recommend it and i haven't had anybody come back and say why did you recommend this piece of shit to me you know it, i mean everybody's at least been like oh well i i i i'm glad i went through the journey or like all the way up to thank you so much for showing this to me i'm mad at myself that i didn't know that this existed so um uh but yeah i i, mean, I definitely in the upper echelon of my favorite movies especially of the western genre and i'm a huge fan of westerns uh so i mean it would be odd of me to uh, to not at least give it a nine so yeah i, I and I mean, it is one of those things where I can recognize certain, like, maybe one or two decisions in the movie that I wasn't entirely happy with, you know, as a viewer. But, I mean, overall, I just loved the hell out of this movie so much that, you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm going to recommend it to everybody. So, <laughs> so yeah. straight nines, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, um, I, I'm like above nine, but close to it, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so it wouldn't take us long. So I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, I. It's funny. Gil brought up the thing that I. I, I wasn't one hundred percent sure that this was even a Kevin Costner movie while I was watching it because I wasn't really paying attention to that. But um, I was kind of surprised right now when I clicked on IMDb and saw that Kevin Costner has actually only directed three films. Yep. And so I personally. While I'm a very big fan of Dances with Wolves, um, I would say that this is comfortably my favorite Kevin Costner movie. Uh, when I when I say that, of course, I'm talking about him as a director. Um, mm -hmm. And then I would say that Dances with Wolves is a very close second because um, I do like that movie quite a bit. Um, I do I actually like I was describing this movie, I need to see it again because I haven't watched it since the, I've seen Dance with Wolves twice. I think the last time I saw it was in the early 2000s, the early aughts. Um, so 
I, you know, I would probably need to watch it again. But um, anyway, and then while I don't have anything against The Postman, I think it's a flawed film, but a very, very good film. Despite that, um, it's definitely trailing as his third best film for me. I mean, I, I need to revisit Dances with Wolves, but I would probably have the same rating uh, upon revisit. But but I am fond of The Postman. It definitely wasn't a bad movie. No, I, I, Will Patton's so good in it. Yeah. Yeah, I think The Postman got a lot of flack just because of its runtime. I mean, it was what, it was, uh, almost three and a half hours? It was but, too long is what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 and, you know, I mean, Bill even mentioned, you know, I, I think you mentioned about how, you know, long open range is. And I mean, it's by far uh, his shortest movie as a director. Uh, but, Terrifying. Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, to me, it, you know, that two hour and 19 minute runtime was not at all too long for this. I, even though there's a lot of, talking and everything like that i mean it's not just it, it, it's not just a bunch of cowboys running around shooting each other i mean there is a buildup of tensions between two uh between two sets of ideas and two sets of incentives that eventually uh results in you know the, the shootout at the end of the movie the obligatory western shootout but um and you know by the way the shootout at the end of the movie is itself is like 20 25 minutes but i, I mean you know there's a little bit of a slow burn element to the movie you know the you know you've got some guys who just want to be left alone you've got other guys who will not leave them alone because they see them as economic threats and you know, eventually hands are forced and, you know, so on and so forth to eventually escalate into what ultimately happens. So, uh, you know, it, it, again, you know, it was just handled very well, like across the board in terms of pacing, in terms of tone, in terms of, I, I mean, geez, the music, you know, Michael Caden's yeah. music, uh, uh, makes me wish that we were still in the 90s because it was, I mean, even getting into the early 2000s, you weren't getting scores like that anymore. So, uh, yeah. yeah. It's definitely big. Um, so I guess we can get into spoilers, right? Yeah. 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 Um, get deeper into... Yeah, so I mean, the... Um, yeah, I definitely... Uh, I will say my before we get into anything else is the most memorable scene for me in the movie and the one that stuck with me to this day more than anything else is um is the scene in the in the in the general store like where we get he gets the chocolate and the cigars. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know why, but the 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 when he tells the guy like, you know, have you tried it? And he says no, like I can't afford it. I don't know why that why that stuck with me. Like something about people who sell things but they can't afford them, and or mm -hmm. at least like the whole point that he makes about like, you know, you might die tomorrow and never to have tried, you know, the the most tasty chocolate in your own store. <laughs> um, so you know, you yeah. need to kind of stop and and smell the roses, you know, like the appreciate. I believe. Things. I think he says it was right in front of you all that time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, nice line. Yeah, no, that 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 alone for that if the movie had no other point that it was trying to make, um, that would have been enough. But but the movie goes way past that, which is admirable. Uh, and yeah, like it, a, I think I think that scene, um, it, I would say, builds into the point it's trying to make at the end with with just all three of those characters deciding that you know that things are changing and they need to they need to, you know, make some changes in their lives for various reasons. Yeah, which is uh, partially sad, but also just, you know, everything comes to an end, whether it's the end of a life or the end of a certain occupation or... Well, I, I feel like, and I mean, I could be wrong about this, but uh, I certainly, I feel like uh, a decent amount of the best Westerns that are out there, um, obviously referring to the movies, not the motel chain, um, uh, they are, they sit, they tend to 
uh, deal with the fact that the time period that they take place in usually is like a, a time of change and like things are coming to an end kind of thing um, in terms of society and their lifestyles and such, you know. Oh, yeah, about uh, changes, yeah, like technologically or otherwise. Culturally. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I mean, just off the top of my head, you know, it's like, um, you know, Shane is about that it, to some extent. The guy's like, you know, um, he he's doesn't feel like his lifestyle's like, you know, um, kind of the way to go anymore. Um, you know, once upon a time in the West, um, you know, is about that whole aspect of the train coming in and everything that's going to change everything, you know, anyway, I'm just, just felt like throwing that out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say two things is about changes and survival too. Cause like sure. some oh, of the other sure. movies are about like, just, you know, trying to um, find gold or make money yeah. or, you know, that's, uh, which I think is kind of what those are the two things open range is sort of about like the two things of like, surviving and the nature of change like survival and the nature of change um yeah I, and, I think i think there's plenty of other great themes within other great westerns i just mean that that's one i i tend to to notice in movies no so cuz uh, i mean one, one thing that I, I tend to the uh, other thing that often westerns are um i don't know it's at least discussed about especially recently it feels like is there's whole this whole debate about how violent was the west and like how much it was like the way it's described in movies um and uh, i know matt was looking into that history quite a bit a little while ago but but um but i'm curious matt like what's um if there's some of that in this movie that is maybe closer to what you've read about like you know the way the west was compared to the way it's often portrayed uh well what i've been able to read um over the years, uh, I mean, one of the things that stuck out to me was just like uh, uh, that there are basically more bank robberies in Dayton, Ohio every year than there were in the entire territorial West over the course of 50. You know, what was there a component uh, like, is there a scintilla of truth to how we've painted some uh, painted this picture of the wild west i mean you know there's always a scintilla of truth but obviously when you look at the actual like historical like gangs and everything uh, and a lot of what we view as like western icons who actually existed in history you know like the james gang and so on and so forth they they actually operated in like the midwest to the east that were already uh part of you know these united states uh i mean you you really have to dig into like butch and sundance and i i mean even billy the kid started his uh career robbing and pillaging and murdering uh uh in the east i mean i i i i think that what is portrayed in in the film is something that could very plausibly be a, a real life uh you know incident in uh the territorial west i mean you know like um you know especially since um everything was so localized uh, i mean it, it's not completely uh you know inconceivable that uh just one one guy is just so wealthy and so influential that he can just buy off a few people who have guns and kind of operate as, you know, corrupt forces uh, in in a town. Um, and, and I mean, you know, even though I, I I'm not saying anything great about the Clantons or anything like that in, in the real life case of Tombstone, but I mean, it's not like the Earps were absolute saints. I mean, you know, they, you know, they, they basically took the, I mean, Wyatt really did basically take the sheriff job uh, because he wanted to make money. I mean, it, it's not really, uh, and, but, uh, and I mean, Wyatt Earp himself had a history of bo on both sides of the law. 
but um you know uh you know there there was definitely uh, some tension in that in that situation that you know eventually led to the famous shootout and so on and so forth um but but i mean at the same time the clantons were basically like uh, the early mafia but uh so there's a little bit more nuance to that but uh it's um how dare yeah. you besmirch their names <laughs> i saw the movie kurt russell was reluctant he didn't want to be the sheriff <laughs> <laughs> well it wasn't his first man <laughs> <laughs> but yeah <laughs> yeah I, I think that uh this movie is kind of um I, it's it's more about it, it it has a big component of the mythology and that's something that does not bother me one bit <laughs> uh yeah so mythology as far as like the um talking about the west and and cowboys. the U.S. or cowboys, that part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because I feel like it does try to be, because, uh, uh, you know, another, like, modern Western, like, Unforgiven was, like, credited as, like, really um, making it a lot more realistic and sort mm. of revisioning, like, the Western and, and like making it like that killing a person it's a is a big deal unlike it is in in movies and i always felt like unforgiven took it a bit too far uh and and this movie maybe found that balance because i feel like this movie does show the consequences of shooting a person and what that's like and and the the jolt of the of the gun and the noise uh, and and the, the 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 mess of it all, uh, and there's even that line with Kevin Costner where he said like some of them haven't even killed a person, and if you haven't killed a person, it's not an easy thing to do, you know. Um, so so it's it touches on that on that revisionist part of it while still saying you know what, but it's still a mess like. St stuff's still gonna get fucked up like there'll be shots fired all over the place but um but there's consequences you know like there's no music like swelling when the shots are fired it's all just very like silence in between the swoof and and the poofs and and it just all feels very real and immediate and consequential which is very very a, a very different approach to the Sergio Leone way of creating tension yeah. so soon. Yeah. yeah it, and speaking of that, I mean that is one of my favorite decisions that they did make is that you've got this beautiful Michael Kamen score and you know yeah, you know, the guy is and he, he was really good at even toward the tail end of the uh uh the shootout he had a really good piece in there. But yeah, for the majority of the shootout, it's just, yeah, it, they made the very smart decision to just not do any music. Just use the sound design, just use the blocking, just use the... And also, like, the majority of it was shot in wide shots. Like, you know, he basically did the anti-Sergio Leone thing where, you know, he was... <laughs> it, it was blocked and shot in a way that you are supposed to see everything that everybody's doing. That's always kind of refreshing. Yeah, no, no. And, and I think the whole, the conflict between the West that was violent and lawless, but then the parts of the West that had law, but the law was easily corrupted, um, you know, because it was localized and all that. It, it just feels like, um, it it's an interesting tension there between because uh, I know we always discuss the you know like between like the freedom of like you know having things being free in your own country blah 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 compared with the fact that order to to the right degree can actually help in a lot of these situations so it's it's an interesting tension because like these two because it's the, at least in this movie it feels like they're saying that the law of uh, free grazing is a federal law uh, but or something like that right or state law but but that locally they don't give a shit about the law because they're like a essentially like mobsters 
and, and are trying to stop people from exercising their their right. Well, um, I don't think um, I, I don't think they were really doing that. I, I mean, they never really established where the movie is set. Um, uh, but I, I think it's I mean, it it's pretty I think it's pretty clear that it's supposed to be the territorial West. So, I mean, at that point, obviously, national law would have nothing to do with it, and state law wouldn't have anything to do to do with it because there were no states in the territorial West. So, I mean, a lot of it was basically like, you know, whether or not you're welcome in this specific town. And if that specific town's economy is built around, uh, uh, you know, the cattle industry that Michael Gammon's character is running and there are some free grazers anywhere near them with, uh, you know, their, uh, with their competition and, you know, Michael Gammon has the money to buy off the, the cops and go out and, uh, stifle his competition. Then that's what he's going to do. And, uh, it's not whether or not it's legal, you know, in any broader sense anywhere else, it's just that this is a town that is, is that has a negative reaction to uh, free grazers because of that uh, economic element. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know, because I thought um, Duvall at some point said something about that, like what they're doing is not illegal and that they have essentially like, you know, if not morality, then like the the state or whatever the broader state yes there might have not been specific rules in that specific area is but maybe he's extending it to say like that within the united states up until that point you know that free grazing would be legal i guess if it wasn't like you know private property and, and whatnot um but um I, I don't know it's uh i just thought that it was like interesting that um, that tension. And, and then also there's a point where Duval was, I think it was in the salon or somewhere like where we said, like that something about that they have the authority to, um, you know, prosecute or, you know, like to, um, like saying like that, that it's not really whoever has the star on its chest. It's, it's whoever is morally right that should have the right to, you know, defend himself and, and, and bring someone to justice, quote unquote. I found that aspect of it interesting. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, first of all, it's a saloon, not a salon. Uh, saloon, but, sorry. Uh, salon yeah. is uh, but, the European uh, term but, for uh, uh, but, living room. <laughs> but uh, I mean, that, that speech is basically, uh, that wasn't like an appeal to, I, I mean, if anything, it's an, an appeal to a God given right. It's not about, you know, authority it's about i mean he literally says you know a man has a right to defend his property and his life i mean it's basically like a you know john locke in kind of you know a philosophical point uh more so than uh any appeal to you know uh any kind of authority. Uh, I, I mean, you know, like really he's saying, I have an authority to defend myself from you. I don't have any authority over you. You have no authority over me, but you know, it, you know, it's, it, it's a, it, his reaction is basically that he has a God given right to, uh, to defend what's his. But I mean, obviously, he didn't say I have a God given right. He said a, a man has a God given right. Well, I don't even know if he said God given, but yeah, I don't think they, they leaned on the God part, but but maybe right. from some sort of like like personal values type of thing, yeah. right? But you know, also, I mean, like, obviously, the average man in these United States. Are, or or in the territorial west at that time in history would have definitely been a christian uh so uh yeah but, most likely but, <laughs> um but yeah i, I it, yeah i think that's what he, uh, what the thrust of his argument was i mean uh, i i don't think he i don't think um boss spearman's interest was ever in uh, legalese or anything like that. It's just about ethics. 
and uh, and probably not even uh, a, a particularly educated, you know, uh, well-read, you know, like, uh, well, I, I've read Immanuel Kant or Jeremy Bentham kind of, you know, uh, philosophical, you know, stance. It's just, you know, knowing knowing the difference between right and wrong at a base at a basic level i I would i would have liked to have seen a little bit more of them actually um driving the cattle you know just like two minutes maybe three minutes i know it's not what the movie's about i'm just saying it's a long movie you know Hmm. well the driving the cattle i mean there's a few scenes of that yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. I would have what they have was okay. I would have liked maybe about one or two more minutes, you know, a couple like of just, scenes. Just like just getting into the details of like the difficulty of actually doing what they're doing, and um, like, yeah, also just like okay, the amount that we get of Diego Luna, um, being his character, being the mm-hmm. young kid, you know, who's competent but um difficult because of his personality not necessarily because of a lack of skill or something like Mm -hmm. that you know um they get the point across the dialogue between kevin costner and robert duvall is adequate Mm -hmm. the dialogue between uh and when i say adequate i'm not talking about the quality of the dialogue i'm saying how much there is you know diego luna's dialogue with um with uh most that it's also good you know every little bit is there it's it's adequate i just think that uh you know just a little bit more like if we could have seen diego luna doing some stuff that would have backed up their feelings you know a little bit more i, I don't know it's not a big criticism like i said i think it's a great movie nine you know <laughs> nine out of ten i just uh yeah i'm sure there's like a three-hour cut of it where he kind of fleshes out the characters a bit more but but i i think in some ways the simplicity is what makes it unique it's the fact that it like it doesn't they don't say too many words like they're men of a few words in some ways like they don't even know how to express themselves very well and kevin costner's got this whole p ptsd thing yeah. to him too so it's all these elements that are like played and he's awkward as hell you know as a as a suitor let's just say Uh, (laughs) all all, all this stuff like really like really like works well um and uh and and it doesn't even completely like it's not even like garish when uh when he proposes to her in the end like you kind of buy it like it's the whole okay it's a movie like he saw her once fell in love he wants to marry her um you know, it doesn't make sense, but you you almost buy it because he's so awkward and she's so old. <laughs> yeah, and you feel like, you know, yeah, you could come across someone and you're like a, at an advanced age, you're not gonna have any kids together. You mostly are just looking for a, a companion to love, and you're just like, yeah, this would do. Like, you know, I've never met someone oh. as special as this. When, when uh, I see that, I remember seeing this movie for the first time, and like all the elements that you're describing, like when mm-hmm. you, you know who he is, we think we know who she is, but all those elements you're talking about about their age, where they live, the times they're living in, and things like that, the expectations on people, and all that stuff like that. I remember the first time I saw it, and you know, um, you know, once again, we're clearly in the spoiler section of this thing, but um, when they're about halfway through the movie, and they've been helped several times at the doctor's house by her, you know, and they're in the bar or the, the little diner or whatever it is. And they say to that friendly guy, you know, the, the, the guy whose dog they saved, he says, uh, yeah, oh, the, uh, the, our buddy's over there. Yeah. He's, he's alive. The, the, the doc's wife is looking after him and they're like, Susie. And they're like, yeah. Oh, no, it's his sister. And you see the look on Kevin Costner's face. And I'm like, I was like, ah, it's on now. Like, <laughs> oh, I mean, there's nothing stopping them now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it also, I, I mean, that is one thing, though, too. Like, you know, when I first saw that scene when I was, you know, 18, I, it, when he was proposing to Sue at the end, I was, just, I was still in kind of that mindset. Of, I, I was in that mindset of, okay, this is, 
like wrapped up in a tight little bow. You don't really know her and everything like that. But then, you know, it, knowing the context and knowing the history, I mean, he knows that if he doesn't pop this question right now, I mean, they might never even have a reason to go back to that town. I mean, it's not like, uh, I, I mean, it's not like they had phones or like, it's not like, uh, it, it, it's not like sending letters by post was the same thing as like communicating over Skype or anything. I mean, the, it, it's, one of those things where, and again, you could die of dysentery, you know, the next day. So, I mean, no, I, I think it was a lot, for what I can tell, it was a lot more common back then to be like, okay, it's, it's been a week. Will you marry me? You know, yeah, it's been, lock that in. <laughs> yeah. Anybody who's ever seen seven brides for seven brothers knows that Kevin Costner pretty much took his time on this one, actually compare it relatively. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, Kevin Costner is interesting because I heard on a podcast um, it was being compared to like Harrison Ford as like these two guys that are like almost the the most the more like um, they're kind of like the the Tom Hanks with sex appeal and uh, like the the uh, you know the the all American like type of like uh, uh, hero um, that um, is just. Uh, you know, the bad, the bad boy that's like very, very appealing. Um, but, but I do feel like that Kevin Costner is not as, uh, as versatile as, um, as Harrison Ford, as Harrison Ford. Yeah. I mean, even though Harrison Ford also, you know, he is somewhat limited. He tends to be like a, a action suspense adventure type of thing, but, but I feel like he's had a bit more, like at least like uh he definitely made more movies than Kevin Costner has but but Kevin Costner also has some iconic parts so it's uh yeah it's a tough call <laughs> it's a good comparison the two of them yes yeah. yeah and Harrison Ford also hasn't directed anything i think that's a little bit of a uh but but yeah i, I understand uh i understand the comparison but i mean you know one thing that Kevin Costner definitely has that um i i i don't think you, you can deny this for you know at all even with a lot of the jokes that people make about him being a bad actor even though he i mean he's not he's made a few bad choices and he's one of the actors that should just never try to do an accent again I and mean, just just don't do it like some actors can do it. Some actors can't. <laughs> but um, the guy is fucking devoted. Like, I mean, he is meticulous. I mean, like the in the production for this film, they actually had a road built to get to the location that he wanted to shoot uh, where he wanted to shoot all the free grazing scenes because he wanted it to be so remote that, you know, you're just not going to see anything. They, they actually built a road to the set so everybody could get there. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, you know, like I used to do all those Western reenactments when I was a kid and, you know, like, you know, we, uh, we spent a lot of time in tombstone and I mean, it's the the town of Tombstone very stupidly turned Kevin Costner down, but I mean, Kevin Costner actually offered to pay out of his own pocket to get like all the asphalt and everything removed and like get the town back to looking like it actually was. Wow. <laughs> uh, and you know, uh, no, we we're not tour. We we need to be more touristy, like. No, people, you know, people will appreciate that. And also, like, I used to do some gun, gun shows in the in their streets and everything. Uh, when you get shot, when you're supposed to get shot and killed and fall to the ground, it's a lot more fun falling on dirt than it is on asphalt in Arizona in August. I believe it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, but, uh, but, yeah, and... You know, Kevin Costner has uh, has said that um, the next movie that he wants to direct, he's basically planning it to be another Western. And I think he says that he I think he's saying that he's 
planning on something like five hours long. Like a <laughs> better like have a, an intermission. <laughs> <laughs> oh or at least uh right? make it a limited series. Yeah, something. but but I mean like the guy knows his history and he has a reverence for it. Like he cares about it. And it's just one of those things where like if he's going to make one of these movies you know that he's going to be meticulous as all holy hell in making it happen. And, you know, that's admirable. <laughs> and the budget wasn't too bad. It was like $22 million, So, I mean, it seems like it did okay in the box office. So it worked out. <laughs> yeah. yeah.